for this part, I'm only responsible for uh, introducing our great moderator, Nikar Mortazavi, who has kindly accepted to moderate the second segment of this panel with experts joining us from Washington, Tehran, Geneva, and Ottawa. Negar Mortazavi is a journalist and political analyst based in Washington, covering Middle East politics and US foreign policy towards the region. Negar is a columnist for The Independent and host of the Iran podcast. She is a frequent commentator for the BBC, MSNBC, NPR, and Al Jazeera, and has written for Foreign Policy Magazine, Politico, The Intercept, and Huffington Post. The Guardian has named her one of the top 10 people on Twitter covering Iran news. So do follow her at Negar Mortazadi. With that, I would like to hand over the floor to Negar. Go ahead, Negar. Thank you. Thank you, Younes. Thanks for the introduction, the invitation. Um, let me first introduce this excellent panel and then we get right into the remarks on the Q&A. We have, let me start with Trita Parsi here in Washington. Trita is the executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft here in Washington. And he's an expert on US-Iran relations, Iranian foreign politics, and the geopolitics, uh, geopolitics of the Middle East. And he has written award-winning books on these issues, including the last one, Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy. Next, we have Erica Moret, a senior researcher at the Center for Global Governance and a visiting lecturer at the Department of International Relations and Political Science at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Erica is a former diplomat and the coordinator and co-founder of the Geneva International Sanctions Network and associate editor of the Journal of Global Security Studies. We also have Thomas Juno joining us from Canada, Ottawa. He's an associate professor at University of Ottawa's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. His research focuses on the Middle East, in particular Iran and Yemen, and on Canadian foreign and defense policy and international relations. From 2003 to 2014, Thomas worked with Canada's Department of National Defense as a policy analyst of the Middle East. And we also have, last but not least, Hassan Ahmadian joining us from Tehran. He's an assistant professor of Middle East and North Africa studies at University of Tehran and an associate of the project on Shiism and global affairs at Harvard University. Hassan is also a Middle East security and politics fellow at the Center for Strategic Research in Tehran. And his research is focusing on Iran's foreign policy, political change, civil military relations, and Islamist movement in the Middle East. Thank you all for joining us. Let me start with Trita here in Washington. Trita, if you can give us a lay of the land in these final weeks of the Trump administration, the Biden team is coming in. Um, Joe Biden himself has promised at least twice on the record that he's going to return to the JCPOA, revive the deal. There's also this talk of leverage here in Washington. Some uh, even in the Democratic circles, argue that Trump's sanctions have created this leverage, extra quote-unquote leverage for uh, the Biden team to use to take more concessions from Tehran. What do you think about all of this? How, what is basically the path forward for Joe Biden when he comes into office in January? Thank you so much, Nagar, and thank you to IPD for organizing this. It's a great pleasure to be on this panel with all of you. In regards to Biden's position, uh, my sense is that at this point it has crystallized. It is not seeking to renegotiate the deal before a JCPOA entry. It has rejected the argument that uh, Trump sanctions can be used as leverage prior to a re-entry. Rather, the position is to quickly go back into the deal through uh, a compliance for compliance agreement, which means that also the Iranians cannot raise any questions as to whether it would be uh, compensation for the damages that Trump has caused to their economy uh, or other issues. However, um, how fast that can be done, what the mechanics of it will be, um, you know, there's measures that the Iranians need to take to come back into full compliance. Those seem not to be terribly complicated and, and may not take too long. However, the sanctions relief, meaning the um, relifting of sanctions that had been reimposed, 
uh, will not necessarily move very fast, uh, mindful of the specific processes that exist for that. So um, even though they wish to move swiftly, I think uh, the process in and of itself may still take some time. It will still be faced with uh, a lot of opposition from uh, Israel, from Saudi Arabia, UAE, possibly Congress. Uh, it very much depends on whether the Republicans win the Senate or not, because if the Democrats take the Senate based on the two elections in Georgia, um, then I think Congress is going to become much less of a problem. Uh, the support that the JCPOA has amongst Democrats right now is far beyond what it had back in 2015. One indication of this is just seeing what happened last week when the three contenders for the chairmanship of the House Foreign Relations Committee, uh, Greg Meeks, Joaquin Castro, and Brad Sherman all signed this letter to the Biden administration calling on them to go back into the deal. And the importance there is that not just that the leadership of the House was in behind this letter, but also the fact that Brad Sherman was a very, very vocal opponent of the JCPOA back in 2015. Uh, now he has shifted side, uh, and we've seen that with some other Democrats as well. If the Republicans take it, of course, it will be uh, quite a different story. So they will face all of those different challenges. I think it will be a matter of political will. Uh, and so far, it seems quite clear to me that the Biden administration is very adamant about getting back into the JCPA rather fast. The real problems, the real challenges, I think will come after a JCPOA re-entry. Because at that point, the Biden administration is going to be seeking uh, new negotiations, add-on negotiations. I think it is quite important that those negotiations are going to be separate, meaning that uh, their failure is not in any way, shape, or form, or at least not automatically going to cause the failure of the JCPOA. Um, they're adding on to the JCPA. They're not uh, necessarily renegotiating the JCPA. But from the Biden perspective, it appears quite likely that they're going to be seeking to change some of the terms of the JCPA, particularly when it comes to the length of the agreement. There may be some openness in Tehran to do so after they've seen the, the U.S. come back into the agreement. And then there's also going to be uh, uh, similar tracks on um, uh, when it comes to uh, regional issues. The position the U.S. takes in those negotiations, the approach to it, I think is going to be quite determining of how the, what the likelihood of the JCP surviving as a whole. If the U.S. approaches the regional issues, for instance, as uh, the Trump administration had done, which is as a belligerent, uh, a party to many of these conflicts, and I think it's going to be very, very tricky. If the U.S. seeks to facilitate a regional dialogue, similar to what Jake Sullivan and Daniel Benet wrote in Foreign Affairs uh, about a year or so ago, then I think the prospects of success might be significantly greater. But some of those things have not yet been determined, but I think the real challenges may actually come after the JCPOA re-entry rather than before, because both parties are quite eager to first secure the, the JCPOA's revival. Thank you, Trida. Let me now move to Tehran with Hassan Ahmadian. Hassan, if you can give us the lay of the land from Tehran, because we have an important election coming up in Iran, the presidential election of year 400 in Iranian calendar um, will be held this June. Hassan Rouhani's second term is ending, so he will no longer be president. And there could be a shift in the political um, a structure of, of, of Iran's uh, next presidency. We also saw that the Iranian parliament last year, the conservatives held most of the seats, so it's controlled by the conservatives now. Um, what do you think would be Iran's position? Trita just explained that the Biden team would like a fast return to the JCPOA. And from the signals we're getting from top leadership in Tehran, it seems like Iran is still eager to uh, return back to the JCPOA. How fast and how serious do you think Tehran is willing to do this? And I also want to ask you, as I asked Trita about um, leverage here in Washington. We also hear some talks of, let's say, compensation for the losses of the past years under Trump uh, coming from some circles in Iran. We also hear talks of a guarantee that the next president after Joe Biden will not again leave the JCPOA. How serious are these as conditions for Tehran um, moving forward when Biden becomes president? Thank you, Nagar. Thank you, Eunice, as well, IPD, for having me on this uh, interesting panel. 
well, I think uh, first your first question, I think, uh, or what you mentioned, I think if the, the notion in Tehran or the perception in Tehran is that it's the United States that violated the deal. Iran is still in the deal. So it's Iran is not returning to the deal. It's, Iran is returning to full compliance with the deal. And, and uh, according to the official view, it has been actually downgrading its compliance in line with the JCPOA, not uh, away from the JCPOA. So it's, it, officially, it's uh, still uh, committed to the deal. So it, the, the talks are how to revive or re return to the full compliance. Uh, the question uh, has been asked uh, time and again, and uh, then the debates in Tehran have been, uh, you know, uh, have seen so much uh, uh, different points and arguments. But uh, uh, I think my, my sense is that whatever we, 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 we would see or hear from Tehran would be a reaction to what uh, the Biden administration would do. Now, treat us points, I think, very, are very encouraging. But uh, there is another uh, argument that has been circulating and is very much heard in Tehran, is that, uh, well, they will be using maximum pressure. Now, if they don't, I think uh, Iran will also, in a step-by-step -step approach, not you know, a full return all of a sudden, but in a step-by-step -step approach, uh, uh, reflecting the mistrust that have accumulated the past few years uh, uh, will return to full compliance. But if the maximum pressure is to be uh, used as leverage against Tehran to, can, to get more concessions out of it, I think the Iranians, Iranian policy is unlikely to change uh, the, the, in the foreseeable future. Uh, the Iranians will keep, you know, building leverage, will keep uh, banking on their deterrence. Uh, and there's another argument is that, well, Iran can uh, do what it's, uh, it is doing now, uh, not doing anything. It is, you know, it's, it's Iran's leverage. I mean, time is not against Iran. It's to Iran's uh, 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 favor. So it, it, it doesn't need to do that much. But there are calls for doing more. Uh, getting out of the uh, uh, NPT and uh, all sorts of suggestions that have been brought up even in, on, in official bodies like the parliament. So uh, this is, uh, th these are the two main scenarios, a U.S. returning to full compliance uh, or to, to the JCPOA and committing to it in practice. Now, in the, the, the notion in practice is very much important. And even the Rouhani administration and Rouhani himself who said that uh, if the United States return, we will return as well. He, he focused on the in practice, uh, uh, you know, point. That is, uh, well, in 2015, Iran committed itself to the JCPOA, implemented its part of the uh, of the bargain, but then the or, or its part of the deal, and then the United States did not honor its part of the deal. So we need a step by step approach to return to full compliance, seeing what the US, uh, uh, US compliance would mean in practice and then getting to full compliance to the deal. Uh, otherwise, if, if the maximum pressure is to be used, as I said, uh, uh, you know, uh, leverage building will continue. And in the nuclear issue, in the regional issues, I think that will be the main uh, uh, argument, the, the more valid argument. And the Iranians will also place their own preconditions on the table, the compensation. They have already taken the issue to the uh, criminal, uh, the, the, uh, uh, to Lahai, to the, to the uh, uh, International Court of Justice uh, as a U.S. violation of the international law, 2231, resolution 2231. Uh, they will bring it to the table as well, I think, if, if there is precondition on the other side. Uh, the U.S., if it's uh, to return to the deal and enjoy the privileges, as the uh, Prime Minister Zarif puts it, it needs to uh, provide more, uh, you know, uh, to, to prove itself trustworthy, which is really, a, a, it's, not, it's not really easy to achieve. And I think it's going to be complicating things even further. But this is how it works if the United States is to precondition the uh, 
issue. Uh, and this has a lot to do, as you said, with Iran's internal politics as well. We're heading to a presidential elections and uh, the previous parliamentary election uh, gives us an indication as to where things are moving in Tehran. Conservative won decisively, though with, with less uh, participation, but still it was decisive win. And I think the presidential election will uh, will move to that direction without a breakthrough on the JCPOA side of, uh, of Iran's uh, uh, current uh, you know, politics. If the JCPOA is to be uh, uh, restored, I think there will be more chance for uh, moderate factions in the, uh, in the presidential election, though I personally don't uh, think that will uh, really matter that much, but still it will be part of the debates of the presidential elections. But afterwards, we will have a conservative, most probably a conservative uh, uh, administration, and things I think will be more difficult in terms of the negotiations with the uh, United States, negotiations with, uh, with the uh, European parties, because you won't see that much of enthusiasm on the conservative party to talk with the United States as a way to uh, uh, sanctions relief and, uh, you know, uh, reviving the Iranian economy as it was damaged the past four years. Uh, so they will uh, be more inward looking though not you know, uh, shying away from discussion with the United States and the Europeans, but still their way of negotiations will be more uh, sort of uh, defiant to any sort of demands on the part of the United States or the Europeans, linking the JCPOA to other issues, the, J the ballistic missiles program, the regional issues won't be uh, on the table at all. They won't be uh, agreeing to that. I think that even the moderates don't have that leverage to bring these also agree to any sort of these kinds of linkages for now without the United States committing to the JCPOA. And I think that also has a lot to do with how the United States will act regionally because the past four years, the United States has subcontracted much of its regional policy to Israel, for instance, in Syria, uh, and, and have emboldened its regional clients and allies like Saudi Arabia, like uh, uh, Israel, and uh, even Turkey for that matter. Uh, and I think uh, this way of dealing with the region from the eyes of Israelis or Saudis uh, has, been, uh, not very, has been very much uh, seen negatively in Tehran. I think the U.S. acting more as, an, um, as America based on its own interest, not from the eyes of the Israelis or the Saudis in the region, uh, embarking on Iran bashing, Iran uh, anti-Iran policies, uh, through those lenses, I think would encourage Tehran to delve uh, even further in, in negotiations with European parties, with other parties on regional issues, as they did previously on the Yemeni issue. They talked with the E3. And on the Syrian issue, they mm -hmm. uh, got into the Astana, Vienna processes, and back the Geneva process. And I think that will be part of it. But uh, the ballistic missile program, I think, as a last means of defense, will be off the table, though Iranians will be willing, as previously, to put caps on the range of the ballistic missiles to tell the international community that this is not uh, a, an offensive capability, it will be and will remain as a dis defensive capability. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you, Hassan. Thank you. We'll come back to you later. You mentioned the E3. Let's go to Europe now with Erica. Erica, I want to, in the first uh, part of this meeting, uh, there was uh, talks, there was discussions about role of Europe, Europe, the European Union, and the E3, Germany, France, and UK played a very important role, especially the EU, in facilitating the nuclear negotiations, bringing the JCPOA um, to a final result, and also in in helping to keep it alive, although on life support, as I call, but still keeping it alive under the Trump years and maximum pressure. Although the Iranians expected more of the economic compensation to be coming from Europe for, for the loss that they're uh, seeing from a U.S. Uh, lack of U.S. presence in the deal, but still I think politically the Europeans uh, stood firm behind the deal. What do you think is the role of Europe moving forward um, with the Biden administration now almost starting within a month, the presidency, and then 
a return to the JCPOA and this talk of follow-on negotiations, as we heard from Trita here in Washington, the U.S. is interested, Tehran is interested in uh, further negotiations, and the Europeans also have their own concerns. Recently, we've heard human rights concerns from European countries. There was a Europe Iran forum that was postponed due to human rights concerns, and we've heard statements from uh, the E3 countries, ger the Germans specifically making some uh, statements about issues. What is the lay of the land in Europe as you see it? Well, thank you, Nigar, for these questions. And thank you also to the Institute and to Younes and his team for organizing this event today. It's a real pleasure to be here, and um, particularly given the importance and the timeliness of the event. So um, as, as you said already, Ambassador Clement laid out very clearly um, many of, many of the, um, the key considerations from the European side and the EU perspective. Um, and I think it's very clear that the EU has a really important role to play politically, um, also in providing technical support to both sides of the house when it comes to questions of sanctions lifting eventually and also on the Iranian side with, with, with regards to um, obligations um, linked to the JCPOA. But um, first and foremost, I would say that the diplomatic um, role as a channel uh, is, 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 is really key in this particular window. There's a limited amount of time now um, through which the EU could um, bring about some form of change in the US. I think it would be, it's going to be challenging um, given the entrenched nature of a lot of the um, maximum pressure related sanctions that have been in place, but I think it's, uh, it's a really critical moment. Um, so this brings me more around to the economic role that the, the EU can play, and, it, and this touches on some of your other questions, Nigar. Um, of course, for Iran, uh, as everybody knows, economic recovery and strengthening of the economy is really important. And what we saw, of course, during the time when the JCPOA was, was operational and when the US rather was still a part of it, there was still a real problem in encouraging companies to actually come back into Iran and invest again and continue operating. And this for me is the really big problem that we need to be thinking about that Europe can be playing a very important role. Because by rejoining the JCPOA, it doesn't just mean that things will be um, up and running with the economy. And the reason for that, of course, is partly that the maximum pressure campaign was so far um, diverged from the EU's um, approach uh, that favours more targeted sanctions in general, although, of course, on Iran and on another number of other countries, there has also been a move to broader sectoral sanctions, which have, of course, in the past been associated with, with negative humanitarian consequences, just because of the nature of how important those particular economies like finance and energy are to a country like Iran. Um, the interesting thing, of course, with the maximum pressure campaign is that um, what we've seen in many decades of sanctions scholarship is that sanctions that try to cripple a country's economy and ultimately hurt its population are considered very widely considered uh, within academia, at least, to be ineffective. So when we look at what the Trump administration was doing with the maximum pressure campaign, we could see it's not going to it's not going to it's not going to help the us um, reach its stated policy aims um, it was over 60 years ago that the naive theory of sanctions was um, coined uh, that referred to this type of approach and and many studies and particularly some of my colleagues in geneva more recently have done have shown that when when this, this breadth of sanctions are in place and this this kind of damage that they impose they're not effective. So that needs to be highlighted, I think, more publicly. And this is a great time to do it because uh, it wasn't so easy beforehand for diplomatic reasons. Um, so this brings me more onto the technicalities of it. And what we see in a country like Iran is that the simple provision of licenses um, or exemptions, exceptions on humanitarian grounds is simply not enough. It doesn't work. And that is because we have this phenomenon of financial sector de-risking. We have over-compliance among private sector companies, medical and food companies, uh, those providing shipping, insurance, and so on. And we also have what is termed the chilling effect among humanitarian organizations and health workers. So we see this, this global problem that's actually been recognized as a crisis by the likes of the G20, the World Bank, the IMF, and many other organizations. And the EU, along with a number of other non-EU European countries like Switzerland, where I'm speaking from, have been doing a lot of work, often behind the scenes, to try and find some solutions to this global and worsening problem. And it's getting, it's getting worse, it's getting to the stage that 
you know, we already see with Iran that, the, that it's, it's incredibly difficult to make any form of payments into the country now. We saw in the press just a week ago that um, the Iranian central bank's ability to pay for the coronavirus vaccine um, was in question because of the various banks that were involved in the corresponding um, financial channel um, were, were initially reluctant to be involved in those transactions. I know from colleagues in the UN that they haven't been able to pay staff in, in Iran and in a number of other countries because of the reluctance of banks to service these transactions. So this is a very deep entrenched problem that started before the Trump presidency, but has accelerated very fast um, under the maximum pressure campaign. And I think because Europe has developed and, and the EU and other European countries have to, has developed an expertise in this area and uh, is, is, is doing a lot of multi-stakeholder dialogues and develop a, development of best practice and so on. This is a really opportune time to highlight this both publicly and privately with the new administration and to work out ways um, and to come up with solutions for this. Um, so it's, it's number one, of course, it's getting back to the JCPOA quickly. It's seeing where um, technical and political support can be helped uh, to the various countries involved. But at the same time, this much broader global problem has to be addressed urgently. Otherwise, the problem will just continue and it could compromise the political stability of the JCPOA again in the future, I would say, if, um, you know, if tensions arrive because the EU cannot persuade its companies to, to reinvest in Iran. So I'll stop there and thank you again. Thanks, Eric. So we'll come back to you later. Let's come back here to North America to Thomas, who's in Canada. Thomas, I want to, especially because we're hosted by a Canadian institution, I want to ask you about um, a shift, a potential shift in Canada's policy towards Iran or relations. We know the uh, mm -hmm. Liberal government in Canada had promised renewed um, relations, diplomatic relations with Iran that hasn't happened yet in the past few years. And obviously, Canada's foreign policy does get impacted by US. So this, what I want to ask you is how this upcoming shift in you in the US and US political structure, and obviously foreign policy towards the region and Iran specifically, um, how do you think is going to impact um, Canada's relations towards and I, I want to make a note that me and you have also talked about this very issue in, in an episode of the Iran podcast. So I want to encourage everyone to go and listen to that as well. So the floor is yours, Thomas. Uh, thank you. So what I'll do is I'll just give in a couple minutes brief historical background on Canada-Iran relations, and then I'll zoom in to uh, two current uh, variables, which is the fallout of PS752 and the election of Joe Biden in the US. So very briefly, in terms of background, uh, 2012, Canada has a conservative government which uh, suspends diplomatic relations with Iran. 2015, uh, there is an election. Uh, the Liberals, uh, led by Justin Trudeau, commit to re-engage uh, with Iran. They win the election. Fast forward to 2018, uh, the Liberals basically freeze their effort to re-engage, not having succeeded in reopening embassies. Very quickly, four main reasons for that. The first one is the Justice for Victims of Terrorism Act. It is not so much delisting Iran as a state sponsor of terrorism. That's hard. Procedurally, it's actually fairly straightforward. It's more the politics around it that are complex and costly. Uh, and here, in that sense, the conservatives succeeded from their perspective in, in really raising the costs for future governments of re-engaging with Iran. Reason number two is consular politics, uh, something that other countries have had to deal with. Iran uh, did its usual thing of taking dual citizens uh, basically as hostages. 2016, Homa Hudfar. Uh, after that, Kavus Sayed Imami, who was killed in jail. Uh, again, that clearly makes it much more difficult. Number three, growing divisions within the caucus of the Liberal Party, uh, where more and more uh, folks were less interested in, in re-engaging. And number four is really just an issue of bandwidth. The reality from a Canadian perspective where we sit is that relations with Iran is not a very important issue uh, wherever you sit on the spectrum. So especially after 2017, when Trump was elected, the foreign policy uh, plate was full uh, and Iran kind of got pushed uh, to the side. Uh, so officially, that's where we've been on the Canadian side since 2018, that re-engagement efforts are frozen. They're not cancelled, they're just frozen. Then comes January 2020, flight PS752 is shot down by Iranian air defenses. 
176 dead, including 55 Canadian citizens. And of the other 120 or so, a lot of them have connections to Canada, permanent residents, uh, students here, and so on. Uh, Canada does not have an embassy on the ground. Uh, diplomats have said so uh, publicly. It made their job more difficult, right, to manage the fallout, the consular issues, repatriating bodies, and so on. Um, and now I'll fast forward to this week, as, as some of you, at least in Canada, might have seen, uh, the Prime Minister uh, Trudeau named a special advisor uh, to help him manage uh, the post PS752 issue. And Ralph Goodale, a former minister respected by people on, on every side of the spectrum, released his first official report on, on what happened. So if you are not a Canadian and have not heard of this, I really recommend that you Google this, Ralph Goodale, Special Advisor, PS752 report. Uh, it is very well done, 75 pages, a chronology of events, um, questions that remain unanswered, ideally uh, for Iran to provide answers for, recommendations on the way ahead, especially on the issue of, of air safety. Um, and you know the, the bottom line of the report is that even though it is very candid on, on what it knows and what it does not know, obviously a lot remains unknown, it is also very clear in blaming Iran for, for what happened. And, and this is a conclusion that, that I, I largely fully agree with. Uh, it, it uses very harsh words, uh, incompetence, recklessness, uh, complete disregard for human life. So there was a level of of, uh, of, of um, harshness, if you want, uh, that uh, maybe surprised a few people in terms that for a government that was criticized by many for wanting to re-engage with Iran, it was very clear here in terms of where it put the blame. Um, so now in terms of next steps on the Canadian side, Canada is, is pushing for uh, transparency. There were a number of precise questions asked to Iran in that report. It is pushing for accountability uh, and also for compensation for families of victims. Uh, my own view, and, and I, I think it's a view that, that many share uh, around the government too, is that I'm not optimistic at all in terms of, of Iran's um, uh, intent, in terms of being uh, transparent and, and willingness to be held accountable. Uh, there may be a, a scope for a compensation agreement, but I doubt that it will be easy, and I doubt that what the families expect and what the Canadian government will support the families in expecting will align with what Iran will be willing to offer. Um, so far, uh, you know, Iran did cooperate a bit in the early days of, of January 2020, especially in terms of repatriating bodies that actually, you know, ended up happening um, better than many expected. But since then, Iran has, has not been willing to be transparent, has obfuscated, uh, you know, put obstacles in front of Canadian efforts to obtain information uh, and, and so on. Iran has intimidated families of Canadian victims in, inside Canada here. And, and I could go on for, for a, a long time. But if, if you look at the Goodhill report, uh, there's a fair bit of detail at this level. One implication of this in terms of, of the, the issue of, of specifically re-engagement between Canada and Iran is that it's, it's largely on the ice. I mean, I'm not aware that the government has used these words uh, recently to frame it like that, but clearly I do not see, uh, and I would not expect, uh, the government to make movement towards re-engagement with Iran as long as the PS752 issue remains uh, problematic, which, as I just said, I expect to remain problematic from the Canadian perspective uh, for at least the short to midterm. Um, I have heard a few times, uh, not from any official source, the, the, the idea of Canada using uh, the, as leverage, you know, uh, offering Iran, give us transparency, and accountability and compensation, and we will, you know, agree to, to reopen uh, embassies. Honestly, I don't see that coming. I don't think that's a very realistic uh, bargain. Some people have suggested it, but I, I don't frankly see it uh, um, for now, at least. I just don't think the space is there politically for the government to do that. Everything I just said uh, goes out the window if uh, the government changes in Canada. Uh, we are in a minority government situation right now. There are rumors of an election maybe in the spring or in the fall of 2021. If that happens and the Conservatives win, which at this point is plausible, um, uh, then we would expect more or less a return of the, the kind of policy that we had from 2006 to 15 under the Stephen Harper Conservatives. Last point that I'll make in just a minute to finish is the implications of the Biden presidency. Um, as will be the case on many foreign policy files, not all, but many, there will be much more alignment between Biden and the current Canadian government. Um, the, the Trudeau government has not, as far as I'm aware, specifically said so, but I fully expect that at some point it will endorse uh, Biden's efforts to 
uh, uh, try to, to revive the JCPOA, keeping in mind everything that Trita said in his opening remarks in terms of how that could play out. Clearly, Canada is not going to say that until uh, Trump leaves because one of our main foreign policy priorities is always to avoid making waves that would attract any kind of wrath from uh, the beast in the White House right now. So we, we really stayed quiet at that level. But once January 20th comes, I assume that that will change at least a bit. Ultimately, obviously, Canada will have virtually no role in, in the issue of, of, of the renegotiation of some kind of a nuclear deal. Uh, we don't have much to say. For us, it's really just a matter of what position the government takes. The only issue, and I'll finish on this, where Canada actually has a concrete interest in the issue of U.S.-Iran tensions more broadly is we have military, uh, a military presence in Iraq where we have been training uh, uh, Iraqi forces. We were commanding the NATO training mission in Iraq until about last week. We finished our command function, but we're still there. Uh, in the last year, especially uh, in January of last year and at a number of other episodes, whenever there was a risk of tension spiking between the U.S. and Iran, um, there was a chill in the spine of, of Canadian officials uh, because of the possibility of escalation that would affect our troops in Iraq. So from our perspective, the possibility of a lesser risk of escalation does reduce the risk uh, specifically at that level. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. And just to uh, note, Justin Trudeau himself had also mentioned that the Iran plane victims would be alive had there been no regional tensions between Iran and the U.S. that shooting down of that Ukrainian plane came as a result of Iran retaliating against the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, which again brings us back to the tensions and the maximum pressure years of the Trump administration. Let's go back to Trita um, and talk. I want to talk about the follow on negotiations or basically these other issues that Washington and, and Europeans, um, frankly, are interested, as well as US allies in the region beyond the JCPOA. What are the top issues beyond the JCPOA that you think the Biden administration is going to pursue and how will they pursue it? Will there be different parties at the table, regional parties? Would this be more focused on regional issues, on, on the missile program? Um, how much of Iran's domestic politics um, is going to be uh, played into this as far as the perspective from the Biden administration? How will it be um, done in your opinion? Thank you so much. Um, the Biden administration has signaled that it wants to have these add-on uh, discussions and that it wants to include uh, some of the regional states. I think we've heard some of the regional states claiming that they need to be part of the JCPOA negotiations. That is not going to happen. Um, and uh, their conduct themselves in, in terms of being spoilers has made it even more unlikely that they would be included. However, when it comes to regional discussions, whether that is Syria, Yemen, uh, missiles, et cetera, it's a, it's a rather different situation in which uh, their inclusion is actually essential. You cannot really have uh, a resolution to some of the challenges in the region unless those countries are also included. But including them will also mean that the agenda cannot just be their problems with Iranian policies. It will also then be Iran's problems with their policies, whether that, that is the Saudi war in Yemen, whether that is uh, the UAE's financing and involvement in many different theaters in the region, as well as their own arms purchases. Because at the end of the day, the Saudis currently are spending five times the amount of uh, dollars on uh, weapons imports than the Iranians do. When you take a look at this alliance that they're trying to create, that in and of itself is outspending Iran with a factor of 10. Under those circumstances, talking about Iran's missiles and their um, length, when the Saudis have more missiles and actually have uh, greater um, length in their missiles than the Iranians do, uh, it's simply not going to work. Um, so an inclusion in the agenda would also include their policies onto the agenda. And I think that is a good thing, ultimately. What I'm a little bit concerned about is that I am not as convinced of why they would be eager for a solution uh, on some of those issues, unless they know that the type of security umbrella they have with the United States, from the United States right now, is no longer going to be in existence. As long as they feel safe that that constant American presence in the region is going to provide them with a major, major um, uh, military and political uh, cover, um, it seems to me that their calculation is that that is more optimal 
than actually going through a diplomatic process and agreeing to compromises, painful compromises with Iran. So mm -hmm. their conduct so far seems to be that they would prefer the status quo of just operating under American security umbrella uh, and as a result be rather dismissive of real diplomacy. Uh, and I think the administration, the Biden administration, wants to move them in the direction of engaging uh, in the region through a regional dialogue. But I don't think that is really possible unless that also is accompanied with an indication that the U.S. itself is no longer going to uh, indefinitely play that type of a protectorate role, a protectorate role that the American public increasingly, incidentally, is turning away from. Mm -hmm. Um, Hassan, I want to ask you about, because negotiations are give and take, and we hear all about what Washington wants more and more and more, what Europe wants more from Iran, but uh, many in Washington don't hear as much about what Iran wants. So let's assume that a return to the JCPOA happens and follow-on negotiations get started on both sides. What is it that Iran wants? If let's say we put these issues on the table that are of concern to Washington, to uh, as well the Canadians and, um, and, and European uh, powers as well, what do you think would be issues that Iran would want and then would be willing to make concessions in exchange for it? Well, for Iranians, I think uh, the, the JCPOA is quite telling as to how uh, another negotiation might end up being like. So Iran has a very uh, strong hand in the region. It has a, a booming, I would say, uh, defensive capabilities, defense uh, industry uh, that all the talks are focusing on. Uh, now, these two, besides the nuclear program, are the three main sources of Iranian power as in, in its deterrence against uh, adversaries and foes, regional and international. Uh, and I really highly doubted that Iran would embark on negotiations on its ballistic missiles program. But on regional issues, I think Iranians will be demanding a, uh, a less, uh, uh, you know, uh, more balanced uh, in the U.S. European role in the region. Now, our region is is really uh, suffering from imbalance. Imbalances are everywhere, in, on national, regional, and the international spillover to it. Uh, and I think this is really something that have been in the debates in Tehran. That others, as Trita mentioned, that are are supporting the United States is supporting the the, the Saudis in their brutal war in Yemen. They have supported them in their campaign against Syria, in their campaign in, in uh, and the, the U.S. got involved in Libya, uh, the oppression of the Bahrainis. These are things that have happened in the region with the support of the United States and Europeans, and the war on Yemen is still ongoing. In the past four years, U.S. policy has basically added to the imbalance in the region rather than decreasing it. Basically, the United States has been supporting whatever the Israelis did, whatever the Saudis did, and asking for money in return from the Saudis and not asking anything from the Israelis. So Iran would ask, I could imagine, a more balanced, less uh, you know, uh, exports or arms exports to the region and a uh, talk about uh, conventional arms uh, control in the region should be regional, I think, and a talk about Iran's regional uh, uh, policy and influence should be regional. Uh, according to the Iranian view, Iran should not be singled out. Iran has its own you know, uh, rationale for its regional policy that is very much acceptable. It's deterring its foes, it's deterring its adversaries. And I think uh, uh, if, if there's a talk on Iran's regional role, it should include Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Israel, others in the region that have been acting as spoilers to peace and security and stability in the region. So I think these are the sort of you know, general points that I think they, within the Iranian debates you can find them on the table. Another issue that I want to reflect on that Just has briefly, been in the talk. Please. Yes, because I didn't hear really uh, very well the ambassador. I think uh, within Iran, I'm sure you're aware of the talks uh, in Iran, uh, 
that the Europeans did not really honor any part of the nuclear deal. That is very clear on the Iranian part. And, and the Iranians had traditionally had a view that they can increase their ties with the Europeans rather than the United States and diversify their international relations. Now they are seeing the Europeans in a way, very w different way. They are looking at them as minors in, in terms of their relations with the United States. And that's why there is this sort of uh, different uh, perception of the Europeans' role in the JCPOA. I think uh, Iranians will be more focused on talks with the United States as, and, and China, Russia, as opposed to the, the Europeans. Thank you. Thanks, Hassan. I want to take a question from the audience. I think, Erica, this would be for you. Um, they're asking that under the Trump, during the Trump presidency, Europe worked hard to keep the nuclear deal alive. But now that Mr. Biden has won the election, it seems like Europe's behavior has changed. What do you think is the reason for this change in behavior? And I believe this is also going back to some of the statements that we've, hear, we've been hearing from um, European officials recently. But um, Take, take the question as you would. Yeah, thank you to the person that raised that. I mean, it's obviously been a big subject of discussion in recent days. Um, this is quite uncharacteristic, of course, because for such a long time, the EU has kind of played a softening role, of course, you could say like a bad cop, good cop role when it comes to sanctions, but also the wider diplomacy with Iran. So um, I think it's I, I can't claim to know the reasons for it, um, but I think it's lamentable. I, I would almost come back to the, the, the point that I made in, in my short presentation, which is that there's this concept that the tougher stance, the tougher, tougher types of sanctions you can have, um, you know, for the whole leverage question is gonna help. But it's, it's, this is why I think there needs to be a, 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 a public statement of sorts or a, a kind of a dialogue that could brings back um, to basics um, you know, why we're using these measures in the first place. Thank you. And I think, Trudeau, you wanted to chime in also on this question of Europeans post Biden's win of the election. Sure. And, and, and I'll be very frank. This is very, very speculative, probably not particularly complimentary to the Europeans. But I do wonder as to whether that is actually a reaction to the fact that what Hassan pointed out, that the Iranians have concluded that the Europeans are minor players in this because at the end of the day, the US calls the shot. One way for the Europeans to reinforce their relevance is to actually play a more hawkish role, be a little bit more of the bad cop uh, in order to force the Iranians to take their positions into account at a moment when the Iranians publicly and privately are reaching the conclusions that it's more important for them to have a solid agreement with the United States and pay less attention to the Europeans. Um, Thomas, I want you to weigh in on the regional issues a little more. Let's talk about a post rejoining of the JCPOA scenario, being optimistic. Um, how do you think the regional uh, issues are going to play out? The talk of other um, regional powers being present in negotiations, the different issues that are of importance both for Iran and the US as well as Europe and Syria and Yemen. Uh, the continuation of the wars and um, what do you think would be the direction forward for some kind of a regional cooperation and agreement? Um, I think that, uh, you know, let, let me just take a step back. I think that that a, a some form of agreement on a new nuclear deal, whatever name it takes, JCPOA 2.0, whatever, I'm reasonably optimistic that it's going to happen. I think it's going to take a bit more time uh, than some of the more optimistic uh, scenarios. Because, you know, even if the Supreme Leader says that they'll do it within one hour, in practice, it's complicated. There's a lot of, of, of agreement on sequencing uh, and, and so on. But ultimately, I think it can happen um, somewhere in 2021. Uh, beyond a, an agreement to come back to the dynamics of the JCPOA with modifications to provide for necessary updates, of course, I'm not very optimistic that there is much scope for agreement, whether on missiles, whether on Iran's missiles, whether on Iran's, uh, you know, uh, support for non-state armed groups throughout the region, uh, or even more ambitious than that, some kind of regional security architecture. And um, Iran is willing to negotiate on the nuclear deal. It is willing to offer, uh, you know, concessions in terms of stepping back on some aspects of its program in exchange for sanctions. The scope for an agreement is there. There's no doubt. The issue is whether the politics will allow us to get there. Iran, I don't think, is very much willing to, to, to let go, to, to, 
make any kinds of concessions on its missiles, maybe cap some of the distance on the longer range ICBMs, that's possible, but that's fairly limited in scope then. And um, for Iran, it, as was said before, as is well known, its missile program and its support for non-state armed groups in Syria, in Iraq, in, in Yemen, in Lebanon, etc., is essential to its security, and it will not bargain bargain that away. And the other uh, thing I would add is, you know, from Iran's perspective, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, it has the upper hand. Uh, whereas on the nuclear program, I think Iran does not have the upper hand because it needs the sanctioned relief because there's a debate as to how much, but it needs it. It hurts. In Yemen, the Houthis are on top. Uh, the Houthis are the most powerful actor in Yemen right now. In Syria, Assad is weak. He's presiding over a hollowed out and corrupt government, but he won the war. Hasn't won the peace, but he's won the war. In Iraq, complicated, but still Iran supported actors hold a very dominant position. So in these cases, and you could add obviously Hezbollah and Lebanon in, in, that, uh, in that. So why would Iran be willing to negotiate for something which suits it right now and which benefits it immensely uh, and which and losing it would cost it a lot in terms of its security uh, because that's its deterrent. I don't see much of a scope for an agreement at that level beyond obviously the nuclear one. Um, Hassan, do you also want to comment on what was just said by Tridon Thomas on the regional issues about having the upper hand in certain areas um, as opposed to J the J JCPOA situation? Yes, uh, uh, well, I think uh, I would uh, second what, what uh, uh, Juno and, and uh, Trita said in the uh, in their uh, points, and I think uh, because I think Iran really uh, uh, is have been very successful in its deterrence, regional deterrence, in terms of uh, its po its policy in the uh, axis of resistance, as it's called in Iran. Uh, its uh, allies are very much uh, in power or uh, more powerful than their adversaries, their rivals in, in uh, the axis of resistance. Even in uh, Yemen, uh, the situation is really, uh, uh, you know, very uh, uh, concerning or very uh, bad for Saudi Arabia, but it's certainly not for Iran, not for, uh, uh, for the Houthis. Uh, generally, I think Iran has been beside the uh, uh, deterrence that it has uh, been building for decades now vis-a-vis -vis Israel and extension of the United States. I think it has recently in the past decade or so has been also doing a containment of Saudi Arabia as a very assertive, very anti-Iran uh, you know, country in the region. Uh, it didn't really uh, go to the extent as to seeking regime change in Saudi Arabia, but certainly Iran has been uh, uh, trying to bug Saudi Arabia down uh, to keep it more, uh, you know, uh, uh, bugged down than to play a regional assertive role as it did in Syria in the, uh, you know, uh, initial uh, phases. So in the regional uh, scene, I think Iran has been, to a large extent, very much successful. It's, uh, it, I don't see really uh, why uh, Iran won't get into negotiations because, it, because it's very, uh, you know, very much uh, strong. And when you are strong, you can negotiate with, as they did with the E3 on Yemen, they have held uh, three or four rounds of negotiations. And I think they have been in discussions on Syria, as you know, the Astana process. I think they are also open to the discussions with others, but preconditioning the return to the JCPOA and giving Iran what it already earned as a, as a, as a result of its commitment to the JCPOA to Iran giving concessions in the region, I don't think that is a recipe for, for any sort of uh, successful diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And I don't think any linkage would work in any uh, shape or form. Thanks, Hassan. Erica, I have another question for you briefly, if you can. We have a few more minutes left. 
Um, you mentioned how sanctions have not been a successful tool, uh, even though they're very popular, at least here in Washington, where I am and among both parties. What do you think would be a good alternative um, if, if, if you're talking about how this talk of sanctions being an ineffective tool and also the humanitarian impacts of them? You talked about the issue of Iran under a deadly pandemic, how the sanctions have um, created um, basically added layers of difficulty to this to Iran's fight against this pandemic. How do you think an alternative path would be? And there's also a question for you from the audience, if you can kind of take both. Is uh, someone is asking, should Euro, should the EU be thinking about taking new measures to be able to act more independently, seeking its own interests in the world? I think it's a reference to how the Trump administration and the Europeans diverge on the issue of, of the JCPOA? Yeah, thanks again for those two questions then. Um, with the first one, although I, more recently, especially since President Trump was in office, I've spent uh, quite a lot of time criticizing, um, particularly a lot of the autonomous US sanctions that have um, fitted under the umbrella of the maximum pressure campaign. I'm not actually um, an, op an opponent to their use because I think if, if you bring them back to the core um, values, I suppose, that were agreed uh, over the past um, 15 or so years, when they were brought, when they were made far more targeted, um, then you you should have a set of measures which actually have relatively limited humanitarian impacts, if any. You know, if you're if you're imposing asset freezes or travel bans, uh, arms embargoes. This is not so controversial. The problem is when you start broadening them um, in ways that actually do start impacting on on um, on economies and, and people, you know, um, sharp declines in uh, access to hard currency, those kinds of things. It's been widely documented in the past that those kinds of scenarios have been associated with um, difficulties for vulnerable groups, particularly um, women, children, those with chronic health problems, um, those on fixed salaries and so on, fixed incomes. So I'd say they they need to be used judiciously and more carefully in order for them to remain effective. So I would say this, this also, I would say, applies in the Iranian case and in others. Um, they need to be combined more strategically with diplomacy and with other policy tools as well. So they don't just operate in a vacuum. Um, so it's, it's, I think, a more um, strategic and nuanced use uh, and not overuse as well is really important here. Um, the, quest, the second question was on new... Um, and Europe acting more independently yeah. when the interests with, for example, the US diverge. Yeah. Well, I think this is this this is, is a related question because of course the, the EU, at least with regards to its sanctions, as I said, has has um tried to use targeted, more targeted measures in the past. And so the, the kind of divergence in sanctions practice teamed with uh, shifts in broader foreign and security policies by the US under the Trump administration has been really problematic for the EU, but also, of course, for Canada, for a number of other major allies um, around the world. So um, it, I, I would say we reached a really critical point and almost a crisis point in international sanctions practice because of the actions that were taken under the Trump administration. So I think there's going to be quite a bit of damage mitigation that needs to be done in order to regain the trust of um, of um, of the allies that, that traditionally have aligned very closely with US measures. And let's not forget, of course, that the US sanctions have also been damaging EU interests, um, not just in the, in the Iranian case, but anywhere where extraterritorial sanctions have been imposed and they could impact negatively on EU companies and individuals. Thanks, Erica. We have more questions from the audience, but we're short in time. I encourage everyone to follow you all on Twitter and follow your work, your academic work. Um, and I want to ask our panelists to make uh, closing remarks, but briefly, please, maybe less than one minute each. We can start with Trita and then move. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure being on this panel. I, I would just uh, close it off by. Um, uh, making a call for making sure that when we go back into new negotiations and when we go back into um, uh, whether it's ads on, et cetera, that, you know, we should remember what actually made it work last time. There is a, a, a literature out there, a narrative, a rather self-serving narrative, I think, that is 
claiming that it's all thanks to the sanctions that this was successful. Well, we just saw three and a half years of sanctions that were far more uh, um, uh, impactful than the ones that uh, the Obama administration put in place. And the Biden administration will never be able to go back to that degree of sanctions for the very simple reason that the Trump administration did not take into account other American interests, didn't even understand those, and as a result, were willing to go uh, to an extent uh, on sanctioning Iran, irregardless of what it would do to other US interests. Biden will not be able to do that. So this belief uh, in, in the utility of the sanctions as the pressuring tool that will deliver so much, I think has now been made quite clear uh, as a result, ironically, of what Trump did. But it was actually not the sanctions in the first place that really were helpful. What really did make the deal work was the willingness of all sides to actually offer positive incentives. The breakthrough came in Oman in March 2012, when the US for the first time indicated that it was willing to accept enrichment on Iranian soil. That's what created the entire breakthrough and everything else followed through that. That concession could have been given years earlier and we would have saved ourselves a tremendous amount. The Iranians would have saved themselves a lot of pressure under sanctions. The West would have saved themselves a lot of nuclear advances that Iran did during that period, which actually strengthened the Iranian nuclear negotiating position. So mm -hmm. as we go into the next round, I hope that lesson is not lost and that we don't repeat the same mistakes that we did before in which we lost a lot of time and actually lost a lot of leverage by thinking that negotiations only can be successful by being tough, not by being smart. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, I think we lost Hassan. He had to go, but let's go to Erica as it's late in Europe and then Thomas and to wrap it up. Thank you. Well, I, I guess I will take a, another step back, uh, if I may. And I would say that, of course, um, if we look at global governance or multilateralism, then the US withdrawal from the JCPOA, along with the Paris Climate Agreement, and then the withdrawal of funding from the World Health Organization were such enormous blows to multilateralism that was already suffering something of a crisis of legitimacy, um, lack of commitment among certain countries, certain organizations. So um, I think globally, this is a really critical time, not just for Iran and for relations in the region and for all the countries we've been discussing, but globally, I think um, going forward when we're thinking of um, everything from nuclear developments to um, other questions of global security, it's, um, the, it's, a, what, it's the next six months or so are, the, uh, are gonna be absolutely vital. Thanks, Erica. And Thomas, final remarks briefly. Uh, so I'll focus in one minute on, on what I'll watch for, uh, what I'll be looking for in the next uh, 12 months or so. Uh, first of all, apparently there's going to be an Iranian official report on what happened with TS752 early in 2021. Uh, like I said in my presentation, my expectations are extremely low in terms of the level of, of transparency that will be uh, uh, at the basis of that report, but it will still be a, a, a milestone to, to watch for. Uh, and then around March, maybe 2021, the Canadian government will issue another report, this one not written by former Minister Goodale, but by a retired senior official from our intelligence service that was hired to head a, like a, what they call a forensic team to try to, to put together the more nitty gritty uh, military aspects of, you know, why was the air defense triggered on that evening and so on. So that should come out around March. Um, I would encourage anybody, including non-Canadians, interested in what happened to, to, to read the report from this week, uh, but also to look for the March one, because there's a lot of information in these reports. From a Canadian perspective, I'm actually quite happy, uh, not in terms of the substance of what's going on, but in terms of the fact that our government is releasing reports like that. That is not a thing that Canadian governments usually do, so I'm happy just in terms of the amount of information that is being released here. I would also note that Chapter 2 of the Goodale report is really interesting and well done in the sense that they've interviewed uh, public servants, diplomats, consular officials, uh, and others who were involved in the response on the Canadian side in the hours and days after uh, PS752 was shot down. And the way that they built the story of how the government responded in the first days is really well done. Uh, it's absolutely tragic, uh, especially when it deals with the, the you know, the, 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 the the, the the relations uh, with the families of the victims um, but it's 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 you learn a lot from reading that including on the the human side so i do encourage everybody if you have time and an interest to look for that i will also be looking for uh, cases in courts families of victims are trying to bring uh, 
uh, the Iranian government to court. I'm not a lawyer, so I cannot uh, explain the technicalities, uh, whether it's on a personal level or on a state to state level, but that will be important and it will play into the politics of the whole thing. I mean, you can't separate the, the legal side and the political side. And last point, and this answer is one of the questions that I saw in the, in the, in the Q&A, um, the Canadian government's uh, political tone in terms of dealing with this was quite tough this week. They really took the attitude of blaming Iran, uh, which I think, again, is, is the, 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 technically they're correct. But the more constructive tone, the more cautious tone of two, three, four years ago is gone. That seems to be the result of the political calculus that that's a better way to go politically um, whether that will continue in, in 2021 uh, is, would be my prediction, but will be interesting to, to follow. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much. An absolute tragedy. The flight PS752, that 176 people were killed on board. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining this panel. Again, we had Hassan Ahmadian, Trita Parsi, Erica Morad, and Thomas Juno. And thank